All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the last lecture here in Unit 7. We've already made it all the way through World War I, the interwar years, and World War II. And I do congratulate you guys on getting through all of that because a lot of that is, first of all, it's very long as you've seen with the videos. And it's also fairly complex. So if you truly can understand all of our essential questions, you've done a really good job and you probably have a very good understanding of history in general. Today, we're going to be talking about a couple things that happened during the actual fighting of World War II that we were unable to address when we talked about conducting World War II, namely the home front and the Holocaust. So we're not really looking at any of these essential questions today. We're more just wrapping things up and uh, getting prepared to move on to our next unit, which is Unit 8, which is all going to be about the Cold War and decolonization. We should be able to compare the home front of totalitarian states and Western democracies. Remember, Western democracies are places like the United States and Britain. Totalitarian states would include Germany and Italy, but also um, the Soviet Union, which be considered totalitarian and use many of the same techniques as Germany and Italy did on the home front. We need to compare the Holocaust to other genocides. And I'll talk about that more when we actually get to that point there, because there is a bit of complexity that I feel um, other history teachers kind of gloss over. And the last thing is we should explain the effects of World War II and identify attempts to address international problems. We'll see that after World War II, just like after World War I, there was an attempt to address some of these international issues. And we'll see how those are, how those have been addressed. And eventually, as we get through Unit 8 and 9, we'll discuss whether or not they've been addressed appropriately. Let's go ahead and begin with the home front. So we've talked about the home front with World War I, and we saw how propaganda was used in order to get, engage in total warfare, where everyone was working for uh, the support of the war. But the way that different states go about uh, motivating their home front is, is something that we need to be aware of. In totalitarian states, both in Germany and Italy and the Soviet Union, there's a lot of forced labor, especially as the Germans take more and more land. There's more and more people who are not ethnically German. And so the, the Germans, uh, the Nazis, need to find a way in order to use that untapped labor. They're not really going to be able to motivate them. After all, if you were Czechoslovak and you were taken over by Germany, you're not exactly pumped up to go work for the Germans. And so many of these workers are forced into work either using coercive means or something that's more akin to pseudo-slavery. Um, and then they were treated incredibly poorly. This is part of the reason why the home front for Germany was so awful, and also part of the reason why the home front for the Soviet Union was bad, as they continued to draft more and more people and force them into war. After all, think about what Stalin did at Stalingrad. He left the civilians in the city instead of evacuating them. Think about your own life as a student. When you are in school, you have different teachers. If there's a teacher that forces you to do things and yells at you to do it, yeah, you might do it, but you're not exactly pumped up to do it. You're kind of just going through the motions and not truly doing your best work. If, however, a teacher really inspires you to, to work, then you approach the work a little bit differently. You approach it with more energy. You're much more like, likely to get more work done, and that work is more, more likely to be better. The totalitarian states are like that teacher who forces you to do work. The Western democracies are much more like the teachers who inspire you a bit more. The United States is going to use a whole lot of propaganda, like what you see here, in order to inspire people to work. In fact, the British will actually use different music in order to get people's heart rates up, in order to get them moving faster to produce more. As we see, similar to World War I, World War II features total warfare, which means everything is for the war. So there's not really civilian goods. Um, there's, there's no real cars that are, are, are being made. It's tanks and planes and automobiles. The government really does step in. It doesn't take full control, but it definitely sets prices, it sets wages. It has a much more hands-on approach as opposed to that laissez-faire economics that we talked about earlier. This actually ends the Great Depression. As much as people like to credit FDR, and some credit is due to him, it's ultimately World War II and this massive amount of production that leads to the end of the Great Depression in the United States and then also the economic boom in the 1950s after 
excuse me, World War II. Now, if we go to our next slide here, we have our victory bonds because you're, you're seeing all of this and you're saying, well, how is the government paying for all of this? If they're producing planes and trains and automobiles and uh, guns and ammo, like someone's got to pay for all this. So the government issues victory bonds. And of course, the name victory bond is propaganda itself. No one gets excited about buying a bond. Everyone's like, oh, a bond. But if you can buy a victory bond and you can be patriotic and you can help your country, well, then you're much more likely to buy it. So we, we see this propaganda poster here. Like we see this woman with this innocent little child here and the scary Nazi in Japanese hands. Oh, do your job, buy the victory bonds. So victory bonds are a loan to the government from people. So if I were a personal, a, a, a private individual, I can give, I don't know, let's say $1,000 to the government and the government will give me a bond. The bond says, hey, in five or 10 years, we're going to give you your $1,000 back plus interest. So that way I have an incentive to give money to the government, which it needs right now. And then I get a little bit of money back. The government gets the money they need for the war. Everything works out for everyone. At least that's the idea there. We also need to talk about women and society after World War II. So just like in World War I, women go into the workplace. They take upon those traditional male roles. They are the ones working in the factory. We have the famous poster right here of Rose of the Riveter saying, we can do it, inspiring women to take up those traditional male roles. Well, after the war, men come back home and women are more or less removed from those traditional male roles, actually down almost to pre-war levels. Many women return home. Home, and this leads to an increase in birth rates. That's why we have the baby boomers. So after the war, you had the baby boomer generation, which is why we called that generation the boomers, is because there was a huge population increase in the immediate aftermath of the war. Even though women go back down to pre-war levels, it still normalizes this ideal of women in the workplace. We know that women have already received the right to vote, and they're already starting to have that legal equality but there's a, a, a difference between legal equality and actual equality. Like it can say in the Constitution that you have to treat women equally, but then you'll, you have to get people to actually follow that law and society to actually treat people as equals. And so now we're starting to see that women are treated more and more as equal. There's obviously still a bit of um, in male preference here as, as more men are able to get jobs and it's very difficult for a woman to get a job, but it does start this process or continues this process that we now um, reap the benefits from today as men and women are seen as very equal to one another and pay is very, very close to being equal between men and women, which is overall a good thing. Now, I had the opportunity to meet a real life Rosie the Riveter, not the actual Rosie the, Rosie the Riveter, but a woman who did work in the factories in World War II, and that is her right there. Ignore me here, and it's just a goofy picture. So once upon a time in my younger days, as you can tell, significantly younger there, I believe this is from 2017, um, I worked at the 51 Stadium right across the, the way from us. It's now the uh, Las Vegas Light Stadium, so there's no more baseball field there. It's all, it's all soccer now. If you remember the story about the Great Depression, about how I met a woman who's father sold the prize cattle for $10,000 and put it uh, all on the stock market. That is her right here. So she was born in 1924 under the Calvin Coolidge years and lived through the Great Depression and worked in the factories during World War II. So she made bombs. So she is responsible for the deaths of at least a, a few people as those bombs were eventually dropped on uh, the, the Axis powers. Um, then you have to Keep this in, in mind here because I, I kind of want to expand with this a little bit. She then had to live through the post world, uh, post world war and into the 60s. So she would have seen the US be involved in Vietnam, she would have seen all of the stuff going on in the 70s with uh. Richard Nixon. She would have been alive for Reaganomics in the in the 80s. She would have been around for the Clinton administration in the 1990s. She would have witnessed um, September 11th, 2001. She also would have witnessed Barack Obama's inauguration as the first African-American president and then was around for um, Trump's presidency, at least the first portion of it, because she passed away in 2019, if I'm remembering correctly here. And the whole reason I bring that up 
is that we often think of the Great Depression as being a long time ago. We even think of World War II as being a long time ago, as being something that happened so far back in the past that no one could ever relate to it. But this is one woman. This is one lifetime. Everything from the Great Depression all the way up to 2019 is one single lifetime. And I think as students of history, especially if you've been in my class all year, you should hopefully have a better appreciation of that. All right, let's stop looking at me. Let's go ahead and move on to our next topic, which is the Holocaust. Obviously, you guys know about this. This is something that's taught um, very extensively in the middle schools, but it's important for us to bring it up so we can talk about some larger issues here. During the war, Hitler advocated rounding up all Jews. Remember, he puts a lot of the blame for World War I and the failures by Germany on the Jewish people. Why does he do so? It's very easy to blame a minority group. You can get everyone on your side by saying, look, we're not them. They're the enemy. They're the one over there. They're the one we have to blame. And a minority group only has so many people and it only has so much access to resources. They can't necessarily fight back. And so since Jews are, were a minority in Europe, there's only so much that they could do to stop Adolf Hitler, which is also part of the reason there was much anti-Semitism in Europe. It's really easy to blame the uh, perennial minority population, the Jews. Ultimately, six million, between six and seven million Jewish people will be killed um, in the concentration camps between 1942 and 1945, about of the nine million Jews in Europe at the time. The reason that we bring this up is we need to think back to question number three, which is all about the atrocities committed during the war because of the Industrial Revolution. This is industrialized killing, the putting people into concentration camps, using the poisonous gas, gas the Zyklon B, in order to exterminate them. All of that can only occur because of industrialization. As we see, it's not just uh, Jewish people, homosexuals, gypsies, handicapped people. Anyone who is deemed as inappropriate for society um, was taken into the concentration camps. This is a picture from the modern day of Auschwitz. Um, so as we see here, and as actually been pointed out to me, this was built in order to be a concentration camp. Uh, I mean, this is if you, I have not had the opportunity to walk in there, but what I've been told is if you walk in there, you see all the machinery, you see all of the industrialization that only could occur because of the Industrial Revolution and how it was made in order to exterminate um, the Jewish population. So this is the most infamous of all of the concentration camps of which Ellie Weisel um, writes about in his book, Night. And then Viktor Frankl also writes about it in Man's Search for Meaning. If you're an individual who has more interest in learning about personal stories of the Holocaust. As we see here, this um, because of industrialization and because of the railways, the Germans could round up Jews very easily and take them to these concentration camps, especially in what is now today Poland, such as Auschwitz, Warsaw, that, that particular area. We, after the war, we have the Nuremberg trials in which the German leaders are brought onto trial for the crimes committed against humanity during the Holocaust. Ultimately, after going through the trial and looking at all of the um, all of the tapes and, and all of the recordings as Nazis did record all of the killings and they, they did so very systematically, which once again kind of shows this industrialized society, 12 Nazis would be sentenced to death. But what is important for us to think about, not necessarily for history, but just for our own life, is that they claim that they are guilty. They say, look, I did that. I know I did that. But I'm just following higher orders. My government told me to do so. I thought that my government wouldn't lie to me. I didn't think they would tell me to do something that that was evil. And in addition to that, like I have a wife, I have children that I needed needed, needed to take care of. If I started to oppose the Nazis, well, they're going to get rid of me. Like who's going to protect my family? And so the question arises. Should soldiers or should people in general receive death penalty for following orders? Who ultimately is guilty? And if we were in class, we would be able to have a bigger and longer discussion about this. But unfortunately, we're not. Um, and it's just kind of the way it is. So it's something for you to think about and maybe for you to kind of discuss or maybe journal about if you're one of those individuals, because it is an important question that we should ask ourselves. Now, what I do want to point out here 
because I do believe that it's important, is that as horrible as the Holocaust is, and it is the worst, it is absolutely terrible, it's not the only genocide. It's not even the only genocide that we have studied in class. We could argue that Jean-Jacques Dessalines and his treatment of the French individuals after the Haitian Revolution was considered a genocide. You could make the argument that the American treatment of Native Americans was a genocide as well. Most people don't make that argument, but some people have. We've even studied the Armenian Genocide, in which 1.5 million Armenians were killed during World War I in the Ottoman Empire. We talked about the rape of Nanking between Japan and China. But we also see these other genocides that I haven't talked about. And this is not an exhaustive list. There is many more genocides. The Cambodia Genocide under Pol Pot, in which he uh, used, uh, he was a communist and took over Cambodia and tried to eliminate anyone who was opposed to him. It was anyone who was not Cambodian. And he also opposed many of religious leaders, including the Buddhists who were in Cambodia at that time. This led to a, a killing of about 1.5 million people, which represented about 25% of the Cambodian population at the time. We've already talked about the Rwandan genocide with the Hutus versus the Tutsi, the Bosnian genocide during the Yugoslav Wars in 1995, in which Serbs, mainly Christian Serbs, killed about 8,000 Bosniak Muslims over the course of two to three days. Even looking at the Sudan in Africa, in which you have 200,000 non-Arab non Muslim Africans killed by Arab Muslim Africans and one million ultimately um, are displaced and are taken out of their home and moved somewhere else. But we even see more current examples of genocides. Now, these aren't officially genocides, at least not yet. Some people have said they're genocides, but there's still a big debate on them. And if we're debating on whether something's a genocide or not, it's uh, not a very good indicator. We have the Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar who were displaced. Now, there were many who were killed, but there, most of them, about 700,000, were driven from their homes and have had to go into a new country, most of them going into Burma. And then we have the Uyghur Muslim population in China, who I've mentioned at least a few times over the course of our study of history, and that is currently going on. Former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo called it a genocide. Now, not everyone in the world calls it a genocide. The UN is currently trying to look, in, look into it and they don't refer to it as it as a genocide but in some ways it is in some ways um it isn't there's a lot of concentration camps not necessarily like the holocaust concentration camps but they are taking Uyghur muslims putting them into camps and then re-educating them or um trying to destroy their culture as much as possible by not allowing women to have children there's been a massive decrease in the amount of Uyghur muslims in the western part of china why do i bring all this up because all of this is incredibly depressing. The reason I bring it up is for more moral reasons. When I feel, and maybe I'm wrong, I feel that when we focus on the Holocaust and we only study the Holocaust, what we end up saying, either consciously or subconsciously, is that genocide was this one-time thing. It was done by one group of people, the Germans, and it was done one time during World War II and in the Holocaust. And then we assume that everything else is okay, but that's not true. Well, we see that we see that genocide is capable of occurring by any group of people anywhere at any time. And it's important for us to realize this because we are currently living in a society that our global society that has at least a couple genocides occurring or what could be argued as a genocide. So it's important for us to think about that, not because it's depressing, but it's, it's, it's important for us to realize that maybe we have a job, that we have a duty to try to call out genocide and prevent genocide when it is occurring. This wasn't an old issue that was just a one-time thing and that has now gone away. It's something that's still current and with us today. Let me go ahead and move on from there because this is a little bit depressing and heavy. And unfortunately, we have to get a little more depressing and a little bit heavier here. World War II, by the numbers, is catastrophic. To compare this to World War I, World War I had eight to nine million um, casualties. We see right off the bat, there's 50 to 60 million soldier and civilian deaths. And you can actually see those here as well. And then you have another 25 million, which is how we get about 80 million casualties, because that's going to include deaths and that's going to include those who are wounded.
The Soviet Union alone had 25 million deaths. So if there's one country who got hit the hardest during World War I and World War II, it is Russia or the Soviet Soviet Union. This truly was the most deadliest war that we've seen, and it left no corner of the world untouched. As you see here, there were 194 countries involved. That's almost every single country in the world. And yes, most of the fighting happens in Europe or in the Pacific theater, but every other country is in some way, shape, or form in, involved. They're either committing troops or they are committing resources um, to, to the cost for either side. What are the outcomes of the war? Well, just as we saw with World War I, there was an attempt to address the problems via the League of Nations. We saw that the League of Nations is incredibly weak, unable to address anything. And so in its place, came the United Nations, which their logo is right here. This was created in 1945 and is still around today. It's meant to address all of the problems that caused World War II. So it's meant to address imperialism and colonization and militarism, um, but it's also meant to prevent genocides. And we'll talk about that more, hopefully when we get to unit nine, and we'll see where the United Nations has done well in that regard and where it has fallen very short in that regard. We also see that part of Woodrow Wilson's idea was allowing for free trade. And so there are international organizations such as the World Bank and the IMF. IMF or the International Monetary Fund that are meant to promote trade. Instead of having countries be against one another, let's break down the borders. Let's make sure that countries can trade with one another. Hopefully that will prevent depressions and stop countries you know, like every country in Europe from invading in order to get their resources. Instead, hopefully they'll turn to actually trading in order to acquire the resources that they need. But what we also see are our two major points in unit eight that we're going to look at the first one is the power shifts to the us and the ussr some country has to be in power i mean that's just the way the world works and for a long time it was europe and we saw that that was because of unit four with colonialism and that was because of unit five and unit six with industrialization and imperialism but Europe's been completely destroyed by two different wars, or you could argue one war with a 20 year break. Someone has to, to step up. It's not going to be any of the colonized continents in the world because they're very much unable to do so. It's going to be the United States who has gained a whole lot of money because of these wars and because of uh, the work ethic and the, the open openness to democracy and all those things that you'll talk about next year in AP US history. And because of the Soviet Union that is uh, flourishing because of communism. So we're going to see that these two societies who have been allies for the couple world wars are now very much going to be against one another as they compete with one another for global power. The other big theme is decolonization. So we've seen these massive European empires that have sprawled throughout the entire world, especially in Africa and Asia. We're going to see the people of Africa and the people of Asia start to fight back and start to long for self-determination, to overthrow their colonial oppressors and make a new society for themselves. All of that occurs at Potsdam in, in, in the peace talk in 1945. Our big three, Churchill, Stalin, and Truman, are going to be there. And really, Churchill is kind of on his way out the door because the British are going to have to rebuild, especially after the Blitz. So it's going to be left up to Stalin and Truman. And this is what Europe's going to look like. Everything in green is going to be the West. It's going to be capitalism. It's going to be democracy. It's going to be one type of way of viewing the world. Everything in red is going to be controlled by the Soviet Union. It's going to be communism, and it's going to be an entirely different way of viewing the world. Ladies and gentlemen, that is what the Cold War is all about, and we'll discuss that more in the upcoming weeks with Unit 8. Thank you for traveling with me through Unit 7. Hope you guys have a wonderful day, and I'll see you next time for Unit 8.